week. Mm -hmm. All right. Then I'll start over. So yeah, let's start the last day of uh, exciting day of uh, this one week uh, school on non-relativistic physics. We have two lectures, uh, two 45 minute lectures, one by Ziki and the other by Natalia, continuing from both from yesterday. And Ziki will start with the last part of uh, the non-relativistic strings. So please go ahead. Thank you, Niels, for the introduction. And so yesterday we talked about a uh, non-relativistic closed string theory. Well, we talked about both, but um, at the end, we uh, discussed the defective field theory that arises in the relativistic closed string theory. And this leads us to the idea of this string newton gafton um, graffiti. So now in today's lecture, I will move on to discuss effective field theory um, on the deep brains in the so-called relativistic open string sector. And we also see that it actually includes more information. It also um, is it's also suitable for describing the so-called non-commutative open string theory. And this will lead us to the idea of um, the so-called Galilean Dirac born infield action. So let me first review what do we mean by um, this DBI action. So that's short for Dirac born infield in relativistic string theory. So let's consider a deep brain configuration where we have a vol volume of dimension p plus one. So this is a deep p brain. And we denote the coordinates on the deep brain to be yi, with the index i goes from zero to p. So note that even though I wrote i here, it actually includes a time direction um, index. And we embed this deep brain in a curved target space. And the embedding function is what we call f mu. So in relativistic string theory, what do, you want to do, what do you want to do in order to derive the effective action that describes the dynamics of this deep brain is that you take um, a wall sheet topology with a boundary and then you insert vertex operators that denote open string states on the boundary of this wall sheet. And then you differentiate it. That will give rise to a coherent state of open strings, which will lead us to a effective boundary action. So this boundary action will in general include um, gauge bosons living on the deep brain together with some number of Goldstone bosons uh, coming from the spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, due to the insertion of deep brains localized in some particular position. And then you can compute beta functionals for these couplings that will lead us to um, some equations of motion in space-time. And it turns out that such equations of motion that determine the dynamics of the DP brains can be um, assembled into this so-called DBI action. So if you look at this DP brain action, it has a dilaton term in front. So that's basically uh, the string coupling. And instead we have a big squat root and with a determinant. And here we have the metric field and cover a mole field. So again, whenever I have a happy notation, that means we're in the relativistic regime. And if you recall a little bit from yesterday's lecture, um, from the sigma model that describes relativistic closed strings propagating in space-time geometry, we found that we have this lambda lambda bar deformation that basically takes away from this narrativistic fixed point and towards the full relativistic string theory. And in front of this lambda, lambda bar term, we have a coupling that we call U. And basically, if we want to go to this uh, narrativistic corner, we want to send U to zero. And yesterday, I emphasized a lot on this renormalizability of the sigma model so that we can define a completely self-contained corner of narrativistic string theory so that we can study it uh, without resulting to the full relativistic string theory. But at this level, when we talk about this DBI action, we don't need to care too much about these um, extra constraints coming from the string Barkman symmetry that imposed. And here I'll be mostly focusing on directly taking the U goes to zero limit, bearing in mind that we might have some torsional constraints. So if you take this DBI action, which is in relativistic string theory, 
and plug in this set of um, background field configurations. And at the end, you send u to zero. That will lead us to a, a no singular result, which describes the so-called Galilean DBI action. And in principle, because we do have the wall sheet theory that describes narrativistic string theory. So in principle, we should be able to start with the wall sheet theory and perform the beta, uh, beta functional calculation directly, which will derive us the equations of motion in space-time that determine these dynamics of the uh, narrativistic deep brains. And from that, we should get a matching with this DBI action. So that's what I'm going to do next. So now again, we take a deep brain with a volume coordinate yi. And to be concrete, I'm going to work with d8 brain. So in this case, because we want to stay in this narrativistic open string uh, sector, we want to choose a Dirichlet boundary condition in the compactified x1 direction. So if you recall from yesterday's lecture, we actually need this compactified x1 direction in order to have a no trivial uh, string spectrum. So I have this embedding function f mu, and on the boundary, we can write um, this action where we have ai denoting the gauge bosons living on the deep brain, and n is the number of Goldstone bosons due to the localization of the deep brain in the x1 direction. So that breaks the translational symmetry in x1. And now, if you look at the variation of different volt shift fields in this action, we see that if you vary with respect to lambda and require the boundary action to be um, zero under the variation, we found that this imposed as a boundary condition that says n equals zero. However, this does not mean that we are killing the number Goldstone boson. Instead, the number Goldstone boson is just uh, being shuffled into the embedding function. And this is because we chose the embedding function to be comp uh, completely arbitrary. That means, especially for F1, which is um, which describes how the deep brain is embedded in the target space in the X1 direction. So if we choose F1 to be arbitrary, that already includes the fluctuation in this X1 direction. So we already have a number of Goldstone boson here. And therefore it's natural that this N is set, um, set to zero, you know, self-consistent way. So in this case, we have an unbroken phase and the full action, including this boundary action, uh, realized the full stream Bartman symmetry. In particular, this AI, the gauge field, transforms no trivially under this ZA symmetry. So this ZA symmetry, just to remind you, um, is the symmetry principle that's responsible for imposing this um, zero torsion constraint on the longitudinal um, world bind field tau mu A. So that was actually important for us to um, maintain the renormalizability of the two-dimensional sigma model. But anyway, it's also useful to discuss this uniformly broken phase where F1 develops a VEF at X1, uh, lowercase x1. So I'm using that to denote the location of the deep brain in the X1 direction. In addition to that, we have a fracturation field. That's, of okay. course, the number goes mm -hmm. Yes, please. This, the, the, the end point of the open string, is that uh, a point particle that is in a representation of the Barkon uh, algebra or something like that? Is that? Can you say something yes. like that? That's exactly the next sen sentence I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> OK, right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out already. So as Yale was saying, um, indeed, if you go to this broken phase by separating out the lamp goldstone boson, indeed, we see that there's a spontaneous sym symmetry breaking of the string Bachmann into the Bachmann symmetry that's residing on the deep brain. I hope that already answers uh, your question, Yellen. Yeah, great, thanks. Okay, thank you. So now we would like to, well, once we understand this, um, physical picture, classically, we would like to perform the quantum calculation to derive the fun uh, beta functionals for this gauge boson and also the lambda boson. 
And it turns out that it's easier to work in this unbroken phase. Of course, we have a larger symmetry to, to work with. So in that case, this n is set to zero, but only classically, we, we can tune this physical value of n to zero, but not quantum mechanically. Quantum mechanically, we still have to keep a counter term associated with this lambda minus lambda bar term around. And therefore, this n still receives a um, no trivial beta functional. And therefore, after some pages of calculation that you can refer to um, our paper, it turns out that we have two vanishing beta functionals at a uh, conform a fixed point, one for n and another for the gauge boson AI. So this of course lead to um, a set of equations of motion, which as you can show, can be realized as uh, from varying this action with respect to the num Goldstein boson and the gauge field. And just to remind you, this F contains the num Goldstein boson in the unbroken phase. So, and this is exactly the DBI action that we found when taking this relativistic limit um, of the relativistic DBI action. Okay, and if you have really good memory, you might remember that yesterday when I was talking about um, narrativistic open string theory in flat space time, I imposed the VR state quantization for, well, I said in words, I guess I didn't really do the calculation because there you can just borrow the relativistic calculation directly and then perform this, um, well, plug in this set of kinematic data that we have in narrativistic string theory. And there it turns out that if you, um, make sure that the vertex operator associated with the gauge bosons um, are BIST in Brent, then as a result, you'll find this Galilean electrodynamics that Shira was talking about in her lectures. So here in principle, we should get the same thing. And that's indeed part of this DBI action. So um, even though I was talking about the eight brain, but it's very easy to generalize this action to DP brains. And if you expand this action to the lowest no trivial order, which is quadratic in the fractions, it turns out that indeed we get a DBI, sorry, a Galilean electrodynamics right here. And of course, this um, extra scalar field that we call N here, I think Shira called it phi now gains a geometric interpretation as a fluctuation that parameterizes the shape of the D brain in the X1 direction. In addition, we can have other num Goldstone bosons um, because we can have the D brain localized in other directions, but both, this, uh, both the Galilean electrodynamics piece and the um, num Goldstone piece have no dynamics. They're not propagating degrees of freedom. However, if you include winding modes, you will see propagating degrees of freedom. And these modes only represent in the intermediate states that propagate coolant type interactions between um, winding strings. And as I preluded, this DBI action actually contains more information than we started with. So we started with imposing a Dirichlet boundary condition in X1 direction. But you can also think about a, imposing a Neumann boundary condition in the X1 direction. So that's what we do now. And as a result, we actually get a fully relativistic result. And this is the sector of the so-called no commutative open, open string theory. So here you don't really see no commutative behavior because I'm, um, well, I guess you really have to um, commute the longitudinal coordinates to see that. But you can refer to my, um, I think it was in the first lecture. I have some slides on it. Okay, so after understanding this Galilean DBI action, um, I'll move on to the next topic where we're going to use this um, D-brain effective actions as some probes for studying some T duality transformations. But maybe I should stop for questions if you have any.
Okay. Well, can I ask a question? Yes, please. Sir. This uh, Galilean electrodynamics, you, we know that you can get that from null reduction of Maxwell. Mm -hmm. So does that suggest that this whole story of the non-relativistic open string, can you get that from mm -hmm. null reduction of a relativistic open string? Um, so I think the short answer is yes. And the exact connection here is that um, this narrativistic open string theory is to do to the DLCQ of open string theory. So that's related to the null reduction. But now you put on a um, compactified circle so that you can actually talk about T duality. Right. <clears throat> okay. And, and that's actually also why it's actually good that you pointed out. Uh, this is exactly why we have this uh, larger matrix in the determinant. Maybe I didn't say that clearly. So if you compare to the relativistic DBI action, well, in the determinant, we have a, um, like n by, n by n matrix. So n is equal to p plus one. And in this relativistic action, it looks almost the same, except that instead of this determinant, we have a n plus one by n plus one matrix. So that's because you can basically get it from um, a DLCQ of open string theory in P plus Q brain, because if you perform key duality transformation, there actually becomes Neumann. So you have one, ex one more extending direction on the DLCQ side. Okay. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And actually I'm going to talk more about that right now. So um, let's move on to discuss to the dis discussions on the dualities in the relativistic string theory. Um, even though we're talking about open string theory, but first I'd like to go back for a bit to the closed string side and discuss T dualities from the first principles. And then we're going to apply the same idea to um, the DBI action. So that'll be pretty straightforward actually. So now let's revisit the idea of the T duality between the relativistic string theory and the DLCQ of relativistic string theory, as I preluded basically um, in the discussion with Yale. So we already discussed in one way of this T duality transformation in our first lecture at the very beginning, where we showed that the DLCQ of string theory is T due to narrativistic string theory if you apply this T-DLT transformation along this light-like circle. And now we want to do the reverse and also apply it to curved uh, geometry. So we start with narrativistic string theory. We'll have these uh, extra one form fields that induce uh, a uh, two-dimensional foliation structure in space-time. And we'll also compactify the X1 direction over a circle of radius R. And now there are actually different T-DLT transformations that you can consider. You can of course, just perform a T-DLT transformation in the transverse sector, but that's quite trivial in the sense that it's very similar to the relativistic case. So I'm not even going to discuss that in detail. We basically get the same type of Bushy rules for the T-DLT uh, transformation of the target space geometry. But it's more interesting if you if you perform a TDLT transformation along this compactified X1 circle. So again, it's a canonical transformation. So we just need to introduce this generating function where we have a Lagrange multiplier X tilde. And if we integrate that out and apply Poincaré's lemma, so for V and V bar, we'll get back to the original action. But instead, if you integrate out V and V bar, you'll pass on to the t dual side of the story where x tilde will play the role of the t dual coordinate. And indeed, as a result, you see that we get this DLCQ of relativistic string theory. Um, it might be more manifest if you take this set of um, redefinitions of the coordinates, where we can eventually write everything in, in this standard um, Lorentz covariant form. However, note that because the dual coordinate is x tilde, which is compactified on the dual circle of the dual radius alpha prime over r. 
And this x tilde is formed by y0 minus y1. So that's a light like direction. And therefore, on the um, QD side, we have a, a compactification over a light like direction. So this is indeed what we call the discrete light cone quantization of relativistic spin theory. And it's light cone because we have this light like direction, just to remind you a little bit, and it's discrete because we have a compacted by circle, so we have discretized momentum. Zuki, uh, can I ask mm -hmm. a Yes, please. Of course. So here, may I should have asked this earlier, but this compact uh, direction, I mean, this has the radius r. When you say this 2 pi r, which metric do you use? There is no such metric appearing in the Lagrangian. And how do you know the length? This two pi so r. It's, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so here, I'm only working in a flat space time. So I, I guess it's kind of like you have to uh, fix all the gauge and choose a particular frame to describe the physics. But maybe your question will be answered already when you go on to the curved background. <laughs> so if you want to wait for, um, well, actually, just in this slide, if you it still doesn't answer your question, you can ask again. Is that okay? Okay, yeah. So, okay. You said there will be a, a, a metric component for this direction, yeah? yeah. Uh, right. So, there's a, there's a more coherent way of understanding it, and so. there we have metric description. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> so, here, well, Exactly following your question, actually. <laughs> we want to put the general curve the background so we have a covariant formalism. Um, and we just want to generalize this idea of um, light like TQRT transformation. Well, it's light like if you perform this TQRT transformation on the relativistic string theory side, but on the side of the relativistic string theory, it's a very regular TQRT transformation around this spatial circle. So to generalize these two curve the backgrounds, we want to start with the sequence model that we constructed yesterday, where we have this um, string newton Gaston data that we call H that contains the transverse Wilbein field and also this U1 gauge field MUA, and also this tau mu tau mu bar, which are the longitudinal Wilbein fields. And we also have the Dilaton field phi. And here, it, well, again, if you recall, this description is kind of redundant. We have the so-called Stuckelberg symmetries due to the fact that they can always redefine lambda and lambda bar. And we choose to work with this formalism where the Stuckelberg symmetry is not fixed, so that is easier to derive the Boucher rule for phi. But unfortunately, I won't have time to go through the detail here, which is kind of technically uh, interesting, but you can refer to our paper is here. Um, by the way, I'm um, just to uh, make sure I'm not um, even intending to list down any exhaustive um, list of references or even the original references. I'm just listing down the ones which are the most relevant to uh, the discussion here. So now we want to say that we want to perform this TTL transformation along this longitudinal spatial circle. But what, we, what do we mean that in this curve of the background? That means we take this um, longitudinal direction to be an isometry direction by introducing a killing vector that we call k mu. And we recall that when k mu is contracted with everything else except for tau mu one is zero. So that means, well, if you go to the uh, flat limit, it's more obvious. This condition basically says that k mu is lying in the x1 direction, but now you can only say it in the tangent space. So now you can perform the TDRT transformation in the standard way by gauging this isometry, etc. And at the end of the calculation, you'll see that we find this t dual action in curved backgrounds, and that's exactly relativistic string theory. But now in the background, we have 
a lilac isometry, which is implied by the fact that GYY tilde is zero. So Y is the direction, um, is the isometry direction. And actually here is referring to this Y tilde in the adapted coordinates. So Y tilde is T due to the, to the original isometry direction. So this means we are indeed in the DLCQ of relativistic string theory on the T-dual side, okay? And if you look at this set of Bushel rules, you might have like one question. So on the right-hand side, when we have this string newton gatton data, we seem to have more components than the relativistic data, which are the tilde ones. And this is of course, because we haven't really fixed these uh, Stuckelberg symmetries. And actually at this point, you can use it as a strong check to show that these Bushy rules are actually correct because they're exactly invariant under this set of transformations. But in order to match the degrees of freedom on both sides, let's now fix the Stuckelberg symmetries by choosing this C mu A to be M mu A, which we also did yesterday. In that case, H is turned into E, which is purely transverse. And the cover among field becomes this M, which contains M mu A dependence. So now the Bushel rules are simplified but however, if you do the counting, we're still missing one degree of freedom. And this is because in addition to the Stuckelberg symmetries we were talking about coming from shifting uh, the Lagrangian mod multipliers, we can also rescale the Lagrangian multipliers without changing the action. So that's another way of redefining these one form fields. And this leads us to the so-called residue dilatational symmetry. And if you've also fixed that, indeed we recover this Z2 symmetry in T duality transformation. Okay. So we discussed the Bushel rules for the closed string theory, and you can also apply to the open string um, sector where you only need to um, introduce separately this gauge component, but you can effectively treat it as part of the cover among field, except that it only takes value on the D-brain. So again, if you apply a very similar Bushy rule, but now for open string theory, you can start with the relativistic D-brain action and applying this set of rules. And at the end, you'll see that we do get this, well, I call it no relativistic, but I guess more accurately, I should call it Galilean, um, DBI action, because it also includes this no commutative open string theory in principle. But here specifically, we start with the DLCQ of um, string theory on a space time filling D brain, just to be specific. Then on the TDU side, we do get uh, this narrativistic um, D brain action. Okay. And we have seen that well, in some detail that this um, lilac T duality transformation of relativistic string theory leads us to a very different looking theory that we call narrativistic string theory. So you might have the question that if we also perform a lilac T duality transformation in narrativistic string theory, we lead us to some, something different. And you can answer this question in a very concrete way. And now I'm only going to work with the uh, flat space time because the curved version does not really change anything conceptual. So again, we're in this gauge fixed uh, target space with a compactified circle in the longitudinal light like direction. And you can perform the standard TDLT transformation, maybe it's not too standard, but you can still do it in the same way by introducing this um, generating function and if you integrate out x tilde, you get back to the original action. But if you integrate out v and v bar, you get a new action that is on the TDU side. But if you really look at it, it just takes the same form as the original um, relativistic string theory. And the TDU circle is again light-like 
on the T-dual radials. So in fact, if you take the uh, light like T-duality transformation of neurotypistic string theory, you just get back to neurotypistic string theory. You, you don't get anything more. And you might say that it's kind of exotic on both sides. Um, instead of the T-duality we had that relates the DLCQ of string theory and neurotypistic st uh, string theory. At least still, on one side, we have a spatial circle. So what is the use of this? And did, if you apply this, this idea of light like T duality in narrativistic string theory, but now to the open string sector, it's kind of more interesting because we know that T duality switches between Dirichlet and Neumann boundary conditions. And when we have different boundary conditions in the longitudinal sector in narrativistic open string theory, well, just in narrativistic string theory, it turns out that we have way different theories um, that are called narrativistic open string theory and no commutative open string theory. And they have way different looking dispersion relation. On one side, you have relativistic dispersion relation. On the other side, you have narrativistic dispersion relation. So it turns out that this light like TDLT transformation relates um, these different corners of the open string sectors in narrativistic string theory. Okay, uh, so any question? Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Great, great question. So like on the uh, closed string side, there's some kind of self-dual mm -hmm. radius, right? Where, where it's, there's an invariance, right? If, if R mm -hmm. is equal to alpha. So at the self-dual point, is there something special happening with the open strings or? I don't think so, but I would be happy to learn if there's anything okay. very special. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's more like the, the closed string sector is really invariant there, right? I mean, it's really this. Yes, it that's onto mm -hmm. the same mm -hmm. thing. So uh, exactly. you wonder if there's something happening. Okay, but that's a detail probably, but uh, it's not that you see. Uh, yeah, or yeah. the question was, have you examined the self-dual point in this open string T-dual relation? Mm -hmm. and, and the, um, but on, uh, on the open string side, because we have different boundary conditions. So uh, yeah, I guess I'm not sure what it means that be, this. Yeah, uh, right. No, it must be broken then actually there. Yeah, yeah okay. mm -hmm. that's what I think naively. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Yeah, but thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> um, so shall we move on? Uh, are there other questions? So next I'm going to talk about S duality. If there's no question. Also, it seems that I'm running out of time. <laughs> oh, but I, I think the, yeah, um, have, the session uh, officially ends at 45, right? And we started a bit late. Right. We started a bit. Joe, you have 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. Okay, great. <laughs> I think that's enough. <laughs> So maybe I will just go on. Okay. Um, so now, at the, well, basically near the end of the lectures, I would like to um, just give you a little bit information about s duality in relativistic string theory. And specifically, I'm just going to focus on the s duality for D2 breaks. So this will lead us to the idea of no uh, relativistic membrane theory. Um, which makes connection to what we started with on the matrix theory side, because this is essentially the DLCQ of M theory. And then if you take appropriate limit, you'll get back to this uh, matrix theory conjecture. So let's see how this works. To make the story more interesting, we'll like to um, not only start with the Galilean DBI action that we just introduced, but also like to couple it to some Ramon Ramon potentials. So this means we're already in this super, uh, super string sector, even though we haven't really discussed it much. So all it does is that we have some Vesumino terms where we have, for example, for um, D2 brains, we have a um, three form and one form potentials. And these RR potentials actually come from some 
for Mionic vertex operators that insert on the ball sheet. So that's generally speaking supersymmetric, but in space time is a bosonic field. And this is always something that you can do from an effective action point of view. And then we can also ask the question whether we can get this uh, extended D2 brain action that is kind of narrativistic from a limit of relativistic D2 brain action. So I just saw how to get this DBI piece and that just requires us taking the relativistic DBI action and take this set of expansions and send u to zero. And that will turn this term into that term. However, if you look at this Vesuminal term, at first sight, it just looks very similar to the relativistic Vesuminal term. But if you think about it, this F hat, which contains both uh, the cover among field and also the gauge field strength on the D brain is divergent in the U goes to zero limit. So I denoted L to be uh, this guy here. And that's exactly the same expression that we have seen before. So that means in order to make this action, well, in order to make this U goes to zero limit, um, no singular, we have to expand the RR potentials in a power no trivial way. Well, um, different orders, different degrees of the RR forms are related to each other. And indeed, if you plug this new set of uh, expansions back into the relativity state D2 brain action and take U goes to zero, you get back to our narrativistic D2 brain action. Maybe it's more accurate that they should call it Galilean D2 brain action. And actually, I also have uh, another called no trivial check of this expansion. So in our paper, which is still kind of like being wrapped up, we uh, plugged this set of expansions into the T duality transformation, the Boucher rules that involve the RR potentials. So it turns out to be a quite no trivial cancellation between the singular terms when you send u to zero. So at the end, you can indeed get a no singular set of Boucher rules um, that describe the T duality transformation in the relativistic string theory. Um, in the presence of the R potentials. You can refer to our upcoming paper for that calculation. But here, we would like to understand something about S duality. So you can say something about um, M3 at the end. So what we want to do is that we want to perform an electro weak, sorry, electro um, magnetic duality transformation that we call S duality here. So now we introduce this Lagrange multiplier that we call F tilde. If you integrate that out, they'll just impose the condition F equals dA, plugging that back into this parent action, you indeed get back to our original D2 brain action, okay? But instead, if you integrate out this gauge potential A, we'll get a constraint equation for F tilde. And if you solve that locally, it turns out that um, F tilde is expressed by this guy. We will have an actual scalar that we call theta. So this theta will play the role of the um, of a, actually a spatial direction on the dual side. And if you integrate out A in this way, they impose this constraint, followed by integrating out uh, the field strength F, which is treated as an independent field now, you'll get to the S2 action that actually describes the M2 brain in 11 dimensions. And the 11th dimension, this actual dimension actually comes from the dual field theta. And if you look at this M2 brain action, it's kind of interesting. We have a new will bind field that has the curve index that I call capital M. So that's the 11 dimensional index. It also has a flat index in the tangent space that they call U, which goes from um, 0, 1, I guess I, oh, I brought it here. It goes from 0, 1, and 10. So 10 is referring to the theta direction, is the 11th space time direction, or the 10th spatial direction. So in this case, we actually have a three dimensional 
foliation in space time. And indeed, this is nothing but the Namagoto formalism for the membrane action. So I guess I never really wrote down the Namagoto formalism for the fundamental string action in the relativistic string theory. But you would basically take the same form except that you replace gamma with tau. So at this point, it's interesting to note that we actually have two different limits that we can consider. One leads to the fundamental string action or our um, deep brains in the relativistic string theory. So that's what we call this string limit. And this is the expansion that we have seen before and we want to send u to zero. And there's actually a different action that we have to perform in order to get this uh, galilean membrane action from the relativistic membrane action in 11 dimensions. So this is what we call the membrane limit. So instead of taking this tau mu a, we'll have this gamma m u with m the 11 dimensional index and u is a three dimensional index. So this limit by sending u to zero will induce a three dimensional foliation structure. And moreover, um, in M3, we have this three form gauge field, which now takes an expansion with the first term that includes three gammas. Okay, so um, if you look at this expansion, it looks a little bit exotic because we have this fractional um, exponents. And that's basically because we have to absorb the um, dilaton field as part of the geometry in 11 dimensions. So by the way, I have to note that the reason that I have a three dimensional foliation structure now is because this tau mu a is extended to gamma m u because we have this one form um, RR potential that enters here and also the dilaton interest here that takes another component. And also this three form gauge field in M3 comes from a combination of the three form RR potential in the relativistic string theory combined with this copper mode field. Okay. But anyway, if you look at the literature, usually it's not written in the way that you take U to zero, which is maybe not that natural in this space time uh, description. It's more natural if you do the sigma model calculation. Instead, you'll find that usually u is redefined in terms of like one over c squared or something similar in the membrane limit. Instead of sending u to zero, you send c to infinity. So now the picture is clearer, especially if you go to the flat li limit. In the string limit, you basically rescale a two-dimensional longitudinal part xa to be c times xa and you send c to infinity. But in this membrane limit, you take three coordinates, x0, x1, and x10, and rescale it by c and then send c to infinity. Okay, so this is just a little bit I want to say about SVLT in narrativistic string theory. And I guess it depends on whether Niels wants me to say more. I still have a few more slides that I can talk about conceptually, maybe for like three minutes. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's your call. Okay, let's say um, three minutes, and then we leave questions to the discussion session. But that that's good um, because we need a coffee break. But and that's also good because we have a whole hour for questions. So yeah, three okay. more. Okay, mm -hmm. sounds good. So I just keep it very conceptual and. And then you can feel free to bombard me with questions about this section. <laughs> so here, I just want to say a few words about some very recent developments that I think are rather important in the relativistic string theory. And if you recall a little bit from yesterday's um, lectures and also from the discussion session, actually, I already talked about it there. <laughs> So we talked about a signal model that describes narrativistic strings propagating curved space-time. That's the string uh, newton gafton geometry. And there we're really careful with the realizability of the signal model. And we impose this string Bogland symmetry such that we don't generate any quantum correction to lambda lambda bar. But um, on the other side, we have to introduce some zero torsion constraint which imposes some low trivial geometric constraint on this longitudinal 
Wilbein field. However, it's actually useful to take a broader point of view by thinking about strings in the so-called torsional string newton gafton geometry, where you don't have any torsional constraints. And this has multiple benefits. First, if you just don't care about like studying a completely self-contained um, narrativistic quantum gravity uh, from this narrativistic string theory, if you just care about studying some classical um, geometries that are narrativistic and they might be useful for ideas of T correspondence applications, etc. You might want to consider this more general perspective without imposing too much um, torsional constraints. And on the other side, if you want to generalize the story to include supersymmetry and consider narrativistic supergravity, it's actually sometimes an obstacle if you have too much um, torsional constraints to start with. So this is why I would like to take it more seriously, at least at the classical level, when we have, we just sent the coupling U to zero without imposing any torsional constraints beforehand. So in this case, instead of having the full string Bachmann symmetry, we don't have any no central extensions. So we don't have this ZA symmetry that I was talking about yesterday anymore. And we only have the, uh, the string uh, lay symmetries. And this means we don't have any torsional constraints imposed a, a priori, but instead we will generate this lambda lambda bar term. So we have an, one extra beta function. In this sense, we're still embedding our theory in the full relativistic framework. And that beta function will lead to some extra equation of motion in space time, which we can determine these torsional constraints loop by loop order in a dynamical way. And in this case, we'll see that, well, the, you, I guess you have seen that in Young's lectures. So in this case, we don't really have this MUA field coming from gauging ZA symmetry, but instead we just have the transverse metric together with this N field, which transforms no trivially under the boost. So in some sense, M and also phi, the dilaton, the cup Ramon field, are part of the geometry. And this means you should come up, you should be able to come up with some um, more general um, algebra um, structure by gauging which you can get all these um, components in the so-called torsional string newton gotten gravity, which also includes this couple of moment field, for example. And then this type of algebra has been realized in a very recent paper but I won't go through it very carefully here. I just want you to know that it's in some sense you are doubling the translational generators and their corresponding gauge fields uh, give rise to the Capra mode field. And moreover, there's also very recent um, studies of this type of limits of narrativistic, of the relativistic supergravity, which leads us to the idea of narrativistic supergravity. In that case, in order to make sure that you have the finite supersymmetry transformations, it turns out that you do have to impose some torsional constraints. And interestingly, if you go back to analyze the realizability of the uh, action principle, and you want to calculate the beta functional of this coupling U, basically to all loop holder, it turns out that you can gain some um, analytic control of this calculation. And it turns out that this type of constraints coming from the analysis of these supersymmetry transformation rules are exactly the constraints that you need to make sure that you have a realizable um, signal model. Okay, and finally, there are also some interesting applications to the idea of safety correspondence that I definitely don't have time to talk about, but I also spell it out in detail here. So either we can discuss more in the discussion section or um, you can just read about it. <laughs> and there's of course also many more other directions that I haven't really discussed. So I'm just giving some references also for discussions, I guess. So maybe I should just stop because I'm just way out of time. <laughs> thanks a lot. Uh, Thank you. Um, thanks for this wonderful lecture. Like we said, because it's super important to keep on, on time. If you have questions, memorize them now or write them on a piece of paper and we'll get back to it uh, at, at three o'clock.
Now, now uh, let, let's do a 12 minute break till five past uh, two, just to get give people the chance to make coffee. Uh, Natalia, I, I, I see you're already there. So Natalia, if you don't mind, we'll start five minutes past two sharp and have a break sure. now. <clears throat> okay, thanks a lot. And also with my apologies for I'm going out of time. Yeah. No, but, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll gain it back. We have a uh, good discussion. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm going to get a coffee and maybe you want to do the same. <laughs> Thank you. I will just stop.